When Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha, speaks, investors from around the world listen. After building Berkshire Hathaway into one of the world's largest companies, Buffett amassed a fortune of more than $70 billion, placing him among the richest people on the planet, promising to give away nearly all of his wealth to those in need. Now, in these difficult times, we turn to this stock market sage for his financial wisdom and calm. In this episode of Influencers, I sit down with Warren Buffett as we discuss the markets and the pandemic that has brought the global economy to a near halt. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Serwer. Welcome to Influencers and welcome to our very special guest, Warren Buffett, Chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway. Warren, nice to see you. Good to see you. So it's March 10th and it's the day after the stock market crashed. The Dow was down over 2,000 points. Oil cratered to $30 a barrel or so. Uh, The 10-year bond went to below 0.5%. What the heck is going on, Warren Buffett? Well, I told you many years ago, if you, if you stick around long enough, you'll see everything in markets. And, and it may have taken me to 89 to <laughs> years of age to throw this one in the, into, into the uh, experience. But, you know, the, the markets, if you, if you have to be open second by second, they react to news in a big time way. I mean, it's not like the market for real estate or farms or, you know, things of that sort. Uh, Does this remind you of any other time? Well, I've certainly been a a fair number of times when panic has reigned in Wall Street and uh, October 19, 1987 and the period around it. I mean, there was there was panic on on, at the close of business on Monday, October 19th. Most of the specialist firms, which were important in those days on the New York Stock Exchange, were broke. And uh, and the next morning there was a check due to the clearinghouse in Chicago that didn't get there. And and sometime late in the morning, you know, a decision, I think Phelan had made the decision, you know, we're, we're going to stay open. But but it, it was really close. That, that, that was, and of course, the financial panic. There were, uh, you had 35 million people on September 1st that weren't worried about at all about their money market accounts on September 15th or 16th. They were all how concerned are you about the coronavirus situation, Warren? Well, you got to defer to the doctors on that. But, uh, uh, you know, you can get into all these figures about how flu regularly kills, you know, 20 times as many people in this country as, or 40 times maybe as much as we've seen in the way of deaths, even more than that. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it is a pandemic. It, it is really spread. So we, we've got something that we don't know how long it'll be with us. We don't know how severe it'll be. Uh, but uh, there will be uncertainty about that for a considerable period of time. There has to be. What precautions are you taking personally? Are, have you changed any of your habits? <laughs> well, I'm drinking a little more Coca-Cola, actually. That, that seems to have warded off everything else in life. I mean, I'm 89. I'm in, I, I just had, had two different doctors tell me I'm in much better shape than I was a few years ago. I'm not sure what I'm doing to get in better shape. But uh, by accident, I mean, I had, the, had an annual heart uh, check where I wear something around my waist for a couple of, and the guy said, my, it's never been better. <laughs> so, uh, uh, no, I really, uh, uh, I'm a probabilities guy in my nature. So I, uh, you know, I, I there's going to be two, 2.8 million deaths this year, and at age 89, I'm a little more likely to be than I was in that group than 10. But 2 million eight, uh, you know, and, and what have we had so far? I mean, it, it, it will grow, but I've always felt a pandemic would ha- happen at some time. I mean, I've, I've actually used that term, I mean, in, in describing things that can, be inter- that can interrupt the progress of them not only this country, but the world. It won't stop the progress of the country or the world. I mean, this is, this is a, a terrible event that's occurring. We don't know how terrible, it, and it, it may not turn out to be that big a deal 
uh, when we get through, but it may turn out to be a very big deal. And we just don't know, and I certainly don't know, and nobody knows. Uh, but there will be other things that happen in the world in the next 5, 10, 20 years. Uh, it, it, that's the way the world works. It doesn't, it's, it's not a totally even course. The progress of mankind has been incredible, and that won't stop. I mean, you flew out here, you know, yesterday or today, and, and you flew over a country that 250 years ago, there wasn't anything here. That's only three of my lifetimes, and there wasn't anything here. And now you've got all these bountiful farms, and you've got 200 and 260 million vehicles in the country, and you've got 80 million owner-occupied homes, and, and you've got 155 million, or whatever it is, million people working. And I mean, it's, it's incredible. I went, you know, when I had a, a medical check the other day, I went to incredible medical facilities that are just two or three minutes from here, and that wasn't here. I uh, wasn't even here a hundred years ago, and uh, so we we keep making progress. We haven't we haven't forgotten how to make progress in this country, and we haven't lost interest in making progress. And that will benefit to varying degrees all kinds of people, including around the world. But there will be interruptions, and I don't know when they will occur, and I don't know how deep they will occur. I do know they will occur from time to time, and I also know that we'll come out better on the other end. And then what about um, the banks? And, you know, boy, they have been they hit awfully hammered. hard yeah. because of rates and exposure to the energy sector, right? Yeah, and you don't know what other exposure there is. I mean, the credit standards have been pretty darn good, and the quality of what's on the books has been terrific, and the liquidity and all of that. The banks are in a whole different situation than they were uh, during the 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, but... Uh, there were, you don't know, you don't know the, the nominals that topple when airlines get bad, and, and then that affects you know uh, that affects energy demand. You know, it's just uh, they're using less <laughs> fuel than they were uh, three weeks ago. So it, there's there's ripple effects, and 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 uh, there always will be in recessions. That's the nature of recessions: is you get ripple effects. We get ripple effects on the railroad, uh, you know, but there's just uh, uh, there's less intermodal traffic moving now because of the supply chain interruptions and all that sort of thing. But that's, you look at, again, I mean, it, uh, you know, in 1942 when I bought my first stock, uh, the Philippines were about to fall. I mean, it, and the, the day I bought it, the, the, the Dow literally was down 2%, and, and 2% then was only two points, literally, it broke okay. 100 on the Dow side. Uh, but 2%, uh, I felt it. I mean, I went to school in the morning and I, Bought these three shares, and when I came home the night, I already had a loss in them. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad you kept with it because well, other people might have gotten Yeah, but I, I mean, all the other kids in seventh grade had their money in <laughs> something else. Right. I mean. <laughs> Getting back to banks for just one second, Warren. Sure. And a specific name, which is Wells. Yeah. And are, are you getting frustrated with Wells Fargo? Well, I, I think they've been through a lot of problems, but I don't think that the, the fundamental franchise and all of that, I mean, I, I'm fine with that. But, uh, they have, I forget whether it's in one out of every three households in the country, and I mean, they the mortgage, mortgage service, I, they, it's huge. It, it, it's, it's, it went through something that various other companies, Geico in the early 70s got, had its troubles. American Express in 1964, when we got into it, it had the salad oil scandal, which everybody's forgotten about, but it was a terrifying event then. Uh, so, we Berkshire, they'll have something will happen to somebody. You can't run, you can't run a place with three hundred ninety-five thousand people and uh, and and not know that something is happening all the time. And you just hope you catch it fast. And the, the moral of the Wells Fargo story is when you hear, hear about something, you, you've got to act fact. Uh, and uh, you can have incentives out there that are incentivizing the wrong thing. And we've had them. Everybody's had them. I mean, you know, anybody has a sales force makes mistakes sometimes in what they incentivize. And, and, uh, and, and bad practices will spread if not jumped on. Uh, and that's what, you know, you saw it at, at Wells. They didn't, I don't, I don't see how in the world they made any money out of the phony accounts. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the cost, again, there's a ripple effect. I mean, if, when something goes wrong at Berkshire, if it doesn't get corrected, there'll be more problems subsequently. And then the, the, uh, 
when, when I was at Solomon, Charlie gave me the form. He said, you know, get it right, get it fast, get it out, get it over. And any time you see a problem and you're a responsible party in, in corporate America, that means just get it right, get it fast, get it out, get it over, and, and don't skip <laughs> and just put that right in front of you and yeah. go to work on it. <laughs> yeah, maybe I don't know about the get it over part with Wells. I mean, it, it just well, if you get off. it if you get it right and get it fast and get it out, you will get it over. Right. Okay. <laughs> and got if you don't the other things you've got, yes. you'll never get to get right. it over. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, let's switch over to talk about oil. Um, you are an investor in the sector through this Occidental Petroleum right. deal from last year. You put in ten billion dollars, exactly. I think, and and maybe some more after that. I know you get preferred dividends, but that investment has to be underwater at this point. And what's your thinking? Well, the the, the ten the ten billion is a preferred stock with warrants, and with the, but the, and there is no market in it. Okay. I mean, no, it's a private deal. But but, but we also have about two percent of the common stock, and that's that's down significantly. And and you know, as I said when I did it, I mean. It, it, the biggest variable is the price of oil, and I don't know the price of oil, and every day it gets quoted. You know, if you have an opinion on oil, you can buy or sell oil either one year out or two years out or three years out or something of the sort. And uh, when oil was in the 30s, uh, there's a lot of agony in the oil patch. And, and the, the math just changes terrifically. I mean, it just doesn't pay to drill in, in a lot of areas. And the Saudis can turn out a lot of it. With practically no operating costs, or you know, I mean, they've got uh, very, very, very cheap operations. I mean, between that war between the Saudis and the Russians, and then also perhaps the secular decline of demand, given concerns about climate change, is this really a great place to invest? Well, I, I don't think the secular de demand will change that much, but certainly mm -hmm. the immediate demand has changed. I mean, the airlines need less, and people drive less if they're working out of their homes, and I mean, you, you can change. You know, when you're talking about something close to 100 million barrels a day, if you change it by 5%, you know, that is huge. I was reading in your annual letter, on the other hand, that you're mm -hmm. so proud of Berkshire Hathaway Energy, which is so big in wind power and has this whole different business model. So you think that alternatives actually have a, have a real future? Oh, alternatives have a future. That, and they are the future over time, but you can't change the world the base of the world. I mean, you've got 260 million vehicles on the road or whatever number it is in the United States, and I don't know how many around the world, and they're not changing what they use tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the average age of the American vehicle, the auto, I think is 11 to 12 years, something like that. And, and so the world can't change dramatically. And, and if anybody thinks you can change energy sources 10% in a year, it, it, it mm -hmm. just doesn't work that way. And, and uh, uh, But w the world is going in the right direction in terms of, of, of working toward uh, minimization of carbon. Mm -hmm. Speaking of those cars, I mean, look at Tesla and what Elon Musk is doing. I mean, yeah. that kind of is a revolution, right? Well, it's, it's an important change, but if you guessed on the penetration of electric cars, let's say we say so 17 million or something a year in, in, in 2030 when I'll be 100. Uh, and I would say that I'd be surprised if more than a third of those would be electric. Well, that's two thirds of them aren't plus all the ones. And so, of the total car, uh, of the total vehicles on the road, it still might be 10 percent electric tops or something like that worldwide. I mean, you can't change this mass of, 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 of transportation. Uh, you can't change it in a year or two. It is changing and should change. Uh, but, but in terms of just the math of, of, of replacing, if, if we said we're going to junk all the cars we have, well, you know, the, con the economy would stop. I mean, we can't produce them. We couldn't replace them. What do you think of Elon Musk, though? If you met him, and would you invest in Tesla? <laughs> well, I think you're trying to bait me a little bit. I don't know. I'm just asking you. You can say no, no, no and no, or no, yes, listen, yes, He's done yes. some remarkable things. Okay. He's done some remarkable things. Have and, you met him? Oh, yeah. He's, he, uh, he joined the Giving Pledge uh, mm -hmm. some years ago. That, 
I've only met him once or twice, but, but uh, uh, yeah, that's a, I've, I've talked with him, but not for quite a while. And would you invest in Tesla? No. <laughs> okay. Um, let's switch over and talk about um, bond yields and interest rates because that's a crazy subject right now. It is a crazy subject. And it is really crazy. Yeah, so what is, what is your thinking on that? I don't know. <laughs> I have never been able to predict interest rates. And I've never tried. I don't, Char, Charlie and I, uh, we, we believe in trying to function on what, or to focus on what's knowable and important. Now, interest rates are important, but we don't think they're knowable. And there are some things that are, you know, this gets back to, you know, sounding, uh, who was it, Don Rumsfeld or something. Known you know, knowns and unknown yeah, and unknowns all that. and unknown and, and unknowns. The, the question mm -hmm. is, is the box that says the knowns and important, knowable and important, mm -hmm. is there anything in that box? And can you tell what's in that box and what isn't in that box? And it's what I call knowing your circle of competence. And my circle of competence doesn't include the ability to predict interest rates a day from now or a year from now or five years from now. Uh, so I say, can I function without knowing that? It's the same way as predicting what business is going to do or the stock market is going to do. I can't do any of those things. But that doesn't mean that I can't do well investing over time. I mean, but things have changed. They're different now because oh, rates are so low. You have negative rates. It's unbelievable. And then yeah. you were talking about Edgar Lawrence Smith yeah. and his discovery about bonds versus retained earnings. And then I think you were saying that it makes, for as far as central banks, it makes no sense to lend at 1.4% and then to have 2% inflation. Well, it doesn't make sense for you to buy mm -hmm. right. bonds yeah. if somebody is telling you that they're going to try and destroy the unit in which the bond <laughs> the promise is included. They're going to try to destroy 2% of that a year. Right. And for you to now pay, now receive maybe a half a percent and pay taxes on it. <laughs> right. I mean, so where, where do you think these low super rates are going to go and negative rates? I mean, no, just no. what are the implications on? Well, I would say that's the most important question right. in the world. I don't know the answer. <laughs> hmm. um, no, if, if we knew the answer, it wouldn't be the most important question. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. I mean, well, I don't like that. But <laughs> no, but it's but, true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so let me let me ask this way then: What has investing in equities changed given the interest rate environment? It makes equities look super yeah, cheap. Yeah. No, it, it reduces the hurdle rate. Right. That's why that's why they like to decrease it. Is that it pushes asset values higher because obviously, if you promised to pay me something at three percent a year. That would have been a terrible instrument for me to own, you know, almost any time in history. But today, if you're good for it, it's fabulous. <laughs> right. I mean, did negative rates scare you, Warren? They puzzle me, but they don't scare me. Okay, fair enough. Um, I want to switch over to Apple, one of your biggest holdings. Mm -hmm. Does does the amount of shareholder interest in this company? concern you or Todd or Ted? In other words, it, the market capitalization basically relative to the S&P 500. Is that something you look at? Well, you look at everything and relate one to another. I mean, that's the nature of markets. So you're always trying to think about, A, what's in my circle of competence, and then what makes the most sense that's within that circle. But the important thing is know where the perimeter of the circle is. I mean, right. that's way more important than how big the circle is or a whole bunch of other factors. So. Uh, I think Apple is a, within my circle of commerce. I think it's an incredible business run by a, a fellow that's one of the great managers of all time, and he was underrated for a while, but now he's being seen for what he really is. Uh, uh, it's, it's an astounding, you could almost, you know, if we had a, I got one. If we had a card table here, well, yeah, we could put all their products mm -hmm. on one table. Can right. you imagine that? Yeah. I mean, uh, and, and just think of, uh, basically the utility of those products to a ecosystem that is demographically terrific and, and uh, finds that instrument useful in dozens and dozens of times a day. Uh, it, it, it's almost indispensable. 
not only to individuals, business, I mean everything. And you have one of these babies now, right? I've got, I've got one of them. I don't have an on me because I okay. would be afraid it would ring and I wouldn't know what to do. And <laughs> it's okay. You can take a call during this. We, we wouldn't be, have a problem with that. And what, what sort of apps do you have? Do you have any apps loaded? Well, they've got a lot of apps on it, but, but uh, the other day, actually yesterday, I was someplace. Normally, I don't carry it in town. I carry it out of town. But, and and uh, somehow, I was having a little trouble just getting to the... But this is only me. Any two-year-old could do this. But I was having a little trouble getting to the part where I actually phone somebody. <laughs> I use it as a phone. Right. So you're not... But I got a lot of apps on it. Have you used any of the apps? No. No gaming apps or... No, people have shown them to me mm -hmm. occasionally. They, there's even some app with... with uh, me involved on this newspaper boy tossing thing. That it's the app that, that uh, I uh, revealed a year ago in the movie. That I went, I, I went out to, to California, and and t Tim Cook very patiently spent hours trying to trying to move me up to the level of the average two-year-old, and, <laughs> and it didn't quite make it. <laughs> and, but I, I supposedly developed an app uh, in this little movie we had, and as I walked out. I, Turned to Tim and I said, "By the way, what is an app?" <laughs> we had a lot of fun. He is a terrific guy, <laughs> right? And, and, and that is a tr that is an unbelievable product. Just a one more about um, those stocks. You know, the so-called Fang stocks. Yeah. And and again, you know, does that approach a a sort of bubble to you when you no, just see? No, it's just the opposite. I mean, you're seeing in this kind of a market, those companies don't need capital. Well, uh, Netflix needs. Kaplan, the, 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 but basically, the big, the big companies in market value don't need capital. And uh, that will separate them from even more from the rest of the pack. I mean, they, they have the, an incredible business model. If you look at the top 10 market value of companies, go back 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I mean, go back years, it's, you know, it's AT&T, the old AT&T, and in General Motors, and Standard Oil in New Jersey, as it was called then, yep. and oh, you, you know the 500 you worked on it, yeah. and uh, but those companies needed money. I mean, when Andrew Carnegie was went in the steel business, he built one steel mill, you know, made money on that, saved it. Three or four years later, he built another one, and it was it was capital retention and and uh, oil, you know, business the same way, whatever it was, and now. The really incredible companies, and the ones that account for just the top five, would have, would be well, well over ten percent of the market value of the company, uh, the country. Uh, they really don't. They don't take capital that much. That, that, uh, they may. They, their suppliers may, in some cases, and all that. But, but they are really, overwhelmingly, they're they're, they're capital light, and, and that is really different. Then the question is, why don't you own Google? And Amazon, those two in particular. Let's take those. Well, two. that's a pretty damn good question, <laughs> but I don't have a good answer. <laughs> the, I, I, I definitely should have owned Google. I, they, the, the guys came to see me before they did the, when they were Larry and Sergey. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and they and uh, uh, and we were. This is a long time ago. I mean, this was before they went public. But they were talking to me about a little bit about it, and and we were using. Search and Geico in a significant way, so I knew the power of search, and I actually used search a lot myself, uh, uh, starting with all the Vista or something going way back. And uh, search is incredibly valuable to me, and 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 it was valuable to to Geico. So I I was capable of understanding that. On the other hand, I had seen that Google was taking out all the Vista to some degree. And I thought, you know, maybe somebody else can take out Google. And maybe if they'd started earlier, somebody else could have taken out Google. So I was always a step behind on that. What do you do? Do you kick yourself? What is Warren no, Buffett? No, I don't. I, I, I made so many mistakes. You know, I, I, if I tried to kick myself, my legs would be exhausted. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> now, it, you, don't, you don't kick yourself in the investment. But, and incidentally, you don't can, can kick yourself when you make a mistake. I mean, it is part of what you do. And, and, uh, you know, and, you know, I was there when Ted Williams batted 406, but it, it was, that means 594. That right. <laughs> and, and what about Amazon? Same kind of thing. Incredible business. But it, why, why it's not too late to, to buy these stocks, is it? I don't know. But you're not, you're not buying them right now? No, but I don't buy much. Mm -hmm. 
That, right. it, it, those, those are the kind of businesses I think about a lot. Charlie thinks about them a lot. You can't help but do it. I mean, those are incredible business stories. Right. I mean, so I the mean, door's not closed necessarily. No, no. Right. No, not at all. Okay. Um, well, actually, you know, one of the other fellows now has bought a little uh, 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 Amazon. I mean, that, that, sh that showed up in our 13F. Uh, Ted or Todd? One of the two. One yeah. of the two bought mm -hmm. some Amazon, right? Yeah, that, that that was in our 13F. Yeah, right. There you go. You took the plunge. Not Berkshire, me. Berkshire took no, the no, plunge. Berkshire took. Yeah, Berkshire. They can do anything they want to do. They can't short Berkshires. There are a few stocks. <laughs> and then speaking a little bit more about Amazon and Jeff Bezos, he owns the Washington Post. Yeah. They offered it to you. My understanding is when it was for sale, or I mean, you talked yeah, to Don. Yeah, I, I talked to Don. Don, sure. And, and why? Do you regret not buying it, or no, did you I, not? That, 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 if I buy anything, it's got to be for Berkshire. You know, I, I, I mean, I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm just committed that way. I'm mentally, uh, Berkshire comes before me, <laughs> and and uh, it would have been a mistake for the for Berkshire on the Washington Post it, uh, because of the political stuff. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Right, right. People would think. I I will guarantee you that 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 Jeff Bezos is not telling Fred Hyatt, <laughs> you know, or, or anybody there at uh, Marty Burr. Uh, it, it, but I'll bet I'll bet eighty percent of the people, you know, or some some huge number of people just generally think that that if you own a newspaper, you tell them what to run every day. I mean, it's just that. It, it, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't happen very often. It used to happen with some papers, obviously, and it probably does still happen with some papers, but it, that is not the way it generally works, and it certainly wouldn't be the way it would work at the Washington Post. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like President Trump may think that. Yeah, well, a lot of, I mean, Kay Graham did not tell uh, Ben Bradley what to write. I can, you right. know, that I know. I mean, and, and well, I don't know Don Graham, but I mean, it, it, they just don't do it. But I will guarantee you that you know, particularly among uh, political figures, but, but really the, the man on the street, uh, they, 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 90 percent of them probably would, would think that the that the Graham family was telling telling editors what to do. I know you're reluctant to wade into politics. Yeah, but I, I want to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I may demonstrate that reluctance. Right. Here okay. Right. Well, good. You will in a second. I'm sure. But you know, we've talked about this before, Warren, that the country seems to be fairly divided up, and you said it's eventually going to get back together. You still feel that way? Oh, sure, sure. What will, how will I, we get back I, together? Well, if you, you could have asked me the same question during the Vietnam period, and I will tell you it was, it was even more intense. I mean, I watched, I happened to be in New York at the time, and I watched that crowd come up. Uh, uh, to Wall Street, I mean, it's coming up, whichever street that is, Broad Street. Oh no, would be, yeah, it may have been Wall and Broad, but whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've I have seen in there are the demonstrators. Viet yeah, and, and and during the Vietnam period, I mean, people were just as inflamed. I would say on both sides. I mean, there were it was it was and it went on a long time, and uh, uh, you know, it caused the president not to run again in the case of Johnson. Uh, so. This country's been, we had a civil war. I mean, uh, you know, it, uh, so we've, we've had, we've always had, we're a democracy, you know, we've got, we'll have strong opinions on both sides and sometimes they, they rev up more than others, but uh, I do not regard this as some unique period in history, although everybody, I've been reading about unique periods in history ever, <laughs> ever since I was old enough to read, so I, <laughs> Some of the things that my, my dad listen. I grew up in a household uh, that that it was the family's belief, uh, and it went beyond my dad and my mother, but went to you know all my uncles and all. I mean that basically that that uh, the, the country had gone socialist, you know, in, in the thirties. Your father was a Republican congressman. Uh, yeah, yeah, very Republican. Um, we didn't get dessert. At dinner until we said something nasty about Roosevelt. I mean, <laughs> my sisters and I, we just, you know, it was sort of ritualistic. <laughs> wow, okay. Um, there are calls on the 
political left and the Democrats to tax billionaires, have a wealth tax. Would that stuff be productive and maybe close the wealth and income gap? Well, I think that, I think I wrote something seven or eight years ago that, about the fact that there was, <clears throat> the, I was doing a little hyperbole, but there was class warfare and my class was winning, you know, basically. I, I, that, there's no question that, that, that capitalism, as it gets more advanced, will widen the gap between the people that have market skills, whatever that market demands, and, uh, and others, unless government does something in between, which, say, the earned income tax credit or all, all mm -hmm. kinds of things. And, and I think that's a proper function. So I would, I would, I would say that if people, they, it, it isn't some diabolical plot or anything, mm -hmm. but look at it this way. If, if you go back to 1800 and 80% of the people were farmers and you were the best farmer in Omaha and I was the worst, the difference in our value might be two to one. You might be worth twice as much if we were out there picking corn or whatever we might be mm -hmm. doing or planting. Uh, but now there's, we'll say two million times, there's 30 million American males between 20 and 35. And if you're in the top one-tenth of one percent in basketball ability or football ability or baseball ability, you aren't worth anything. If you're in the top hundredth of one percent, you're getting close. So if, that's, if the payoff is huge because some guy discovered television many years ago and another guy discovered pay TV or cable and then pay TV, so that your talents, where Ted Williams got $20,000 a year for batting 406, your talents now, if you, if you make the majors, still doesn't pay well in the minors, but if you finally get to that 100th of 1%, now you're, you're worth millions. And uh, one-tenth of 1%, you can, that is, you can just play sandlot ball. And hmm. so you get this pushing of extreme rewards to people who are very, very good at something the market demands. And people demand entertainment. They demand people, apparently, that arbitrage securities. You know, I mean, there's, all, there's certain specialties. And uh, that isn't because a bunch of people are sitting in a room deciding we're going to figure out how to take it away from the poor or anything like that. It's because of the market system. But we want the market system to keep functioning that way. But we don't want people left behind in a society where you've got $60,000 plus of GDP per capita. It, 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 uh, and that the people on the, on, in, in the lower half have been getting, falling behind the gains overall achieved by the country. And we've, they aren't worse off than they were 20 years ago. They're, they're somewhat better off, mm -hmm. and they're better off they're better off because of things like an iPhone. I mean, you know, that's, that's something that's terribly useful. And, and, uh, and everybody, I, I get the benefits of search, you know, for nothing, you know, basically. And, uh, but that's the ultimate tension, is how do you keep a system that produces in incredible benefits for everybody, you know? Sports is an easy example, because we all like to, to, to watch them. We don't want to watch a bunch of guys like you and me play, right. <laughs> play basketball. Yeah. Uh, so that's where the money is. But, yeah. That didn't exist 200 but years ago. But then how do we address that? We address it through things like the earned income tax credit. And we, ad we address it so that anybody that works 40 hours a week and has a couple of kids, that they don't need a second job in the family. They can have a decent life. Does that mean increasing the minimum wage? It means increasing the earned income tax credit right, because yeah, I think yeah, that's a right. better system. Yeah, what they right. need is more money in their pocket. Yeah. Now you can do more money in the pocket through a minimum wage, but you don't work, have as many people working. Yeah. You, you need something so they have money in their pocket. Right. And we can do that and that does require a, in my view, it requires higher taxes on people that where they were born into this world with peculiar talents that, that marvelously now and in 200 years ago, they would have been out there picking corn with me. Can you take the higher taxes on wealthy people and put it directly to the earned income tax credit? Well, you could. I mean, because people complain, oh, my taxes are going well, up. They're squandered. Uh, yeah, they, nobody likes taxes, obviously. Yeah, but if you put had a program where it was earmarked. Well, that's, that's what people do in their, when they're on the debate stage, 
you know, currently it's the Democrats, and they, they tell you all their new programs and how they'll pay for it, but they don't tell you how they're going to pay yeah. for the ones that are already there. Uh, nobody's discussed the trillion dollar deficit we have, so to talk about how you're going to introduce some new pro But basically, you don't want to run deficits indefinitely that increase the relationship of debt to GDP. There's, there's, there's some point at which that causes real problems, right. although we haven't seen it a lot of places that you might expect to see it. But this country has the, the productive capacity to let people like me live extraordinarily well, or sports stars, or entertainment stars, all, all kinds of good managers, whatever, and still make sure that nobody is really left so that two people have to work and you have to hold two jobs and you wonder how you're going right. to feed your kids if you're, if you're working. Uh, you know, seven fifty an hour doesn't do it, and ten dollars an hour doesn't do it. But we can do it. We have the resources to do it. You said, uh, shifting gears for a little bit, you said you might continue to underperform the S and P five hundred. You might continue. Well, I, I I will from time to time <laughs> for sure. But what, what is the appeal then to own Berkshire Hathaway stock? Well, I've got ninety nine percent of my money. You know, so <laughs> I'm, it appeals to me, but. Uh, and it appeals to, actually it appeals to a lot of people who feel very comfortable with the fact that we'll never blow it, <laughs> basically. And it, uh, I think that they could feel very certain uh, relative to almost any company that uh, uh, you know we won't be at the bottom quartile or something of performance, but they can feel very they also should feel very <laughs> we're not going to be in the top decile either. Uh, we, we run it. We run, if you're a shareholder of Berkshire, we, we are running the business like you've got 100% of your money in, and you're going to keep it in and it's up to us to take care of it. You said that um, my market value, my value is not so high and it seems like you're trying to really create a Berkshire Hathaway that works well, maybe not in perpetuity, but for a very long time. Yeah. And then you also said we're well prepared for succession. It's almost going to be embarrassing how well. Yeah, well, what, does that, what does that mean? Well, it just means that, 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 that Berkshire doesn't need me. And, and we've got somebody that's extremely oh, better than I am in many, 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 many respects uh, to succeed me. And, that's, and, 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 it, and you want that in a company. And, and I want it. I mean, I, I, you know, whatever the number may be, but it's many billions that will go for vaccines or whatever it may be. Uh, uh, education uh, for decades to come that, that depends on that. But more important, it's it's really a couple, it's at least a million people where a disproportionate number have got something close to their whole savings in. And so we're their partner. I mean, Berkshire came out of a partnership. Charlie ran a partnership, I ran a partnership. We actually, we do look at the people as partners and we look at a partner as somebody who trusts us to make sure that we we don't, they don't get killed in the process. <laughs> and they are not, if they're, if they're shooting for the top 1% of performance or 5% of important, they're not going to find it. They might have found it in our partnership back when we worked with tiny sums of money, but we can't do it. And we don't want anybody to think we can do it. You said a person uh, to succeed me, I think, just now. And, and so uh, is that a person that we know or is it, I mean, there are various people at the top of Berkshire that you've tapped and there's Greg and, and Ajit are going to be on stage this year at the meeting? I, it, it depends what happens to me and what happens to other people. But, mm. but It's not that, Justin Bieber or someone out there. No, it isn't even Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> the, but uh, the interesting thing is, uh, if you take our te top 10 holdings at Berkshire, they probably come out, you know, we got 150 billion in them. Mm -hmm. I don't know who the successor is to the CEO in any one of those 10. And I've watched a lot of successors come and go in, in those holdings. So uh, to think that we wouldn't have somebody able is just crazy. I mean, in, in our case, that, that uh, you know, it, it's just that the ultimate responsibility of the board of directors is to, to have the right CEO and be prepared for if something happens to that person. Right. You said that we possess skilled and devoted top managers for whom running Berkshire is far more than simply having a high-paying or prestigious job. How do you know that? 
Well, you don't know it for sure, but but you gotta make judgments on that. You make judgments on a marriage, I mean, you know, and, and you've got more time to look them over and and and, and selecting successor CEOs, but. That's the most important decision, though, that you make. It isn't what their IQ is. And it, it, it isn't even necessarily the top, maybe in a given type of managerial skill. I mean, if they're, if they're the kind that will leave you tomorrow, I mean, you really want somebody that is devoted to Berkshire. Has and incidentally, we look for the same thing in our subsidiaries. In other words, we, we've got a group of managers, and Dozens and dozens and dozens. Now, everyone doesn't feel this way. I mean, but we've got a much higher percentage that feel that way than I think than virtually anybody has. But, right. but you, you can't bat a, a thousand in that game. Uh, another topic that people are very keen on right now is student debt. And I know that you have really prided yourself on helping students. Is this something that really concerns you? Well, it, it would be a tough consideration for me if I were going to school, whether I wanted to not only invest, I'm talking about college, uh, whether I wanted to invest the four years. I, I didn't want to go to college that much when I went, got out of high school. But, but not only the four years, but if I had to incur, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in student debt, I, I, I don't know what, which decision I would make. Uh, no, it's, it, you know, higher education is really expensive, and we've helped out many thousands of students in the Gates Foundation has done the same thing, and, and other of the foundations that I support. But, but it's just expensive. It's very. Is expensive. it still worth it? It depends on the individual. It depends on the individual more than the school. I mean, it. Uh, uh, there's a lot to learn in those four years. I mean, there's a lot you can learn in those four years, and whether you do or not depends on more on the individual. Uh, I don't think it. I don't think it makes sense for everybody to go to college. You know. I, I, uh, and I'm not so sure it made sense for me to go to college. Uh, really? Come on. No, I, I'm not kidding. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I, I, I learned a lot by reading. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I spent three or four years, well, counting graduate school, four years, uh, that I could have been doing other things. I, <laughs> and there were a lot of intelligent things to do then. <laughs> Who knows? I, no, I, I don't think it was a cinch. I mean, I... I had some wonderful people I met through it. Main thing when I went to Columbia, though, with, with uh, taking Ben Graham's course, I already knew what he was going to say. I mean, I, I, I read it. I understood. You know, I mean, he was a very good writer. But it was inspirational. It was inspirational more than it was educational. We have a few questions from um, our audience at Yahoo Finance uh, from Twitter. One is, what advice would you give to a young investor today? Well, you've got to understand accounting. Uh, you've got to, that's got to be like a language to you. And uh, so, yeah, you have to know what you're reading. I mean, and, and, and unless you know that language, and, and, and some people have more aptitude for that than others. Uh, you know, but, uh, and that's one thing I learned by myself. Now, I took courses in it afterwards, for example, but I've been, I learned it myself in it largely. Uh, so you have to do that, and you have to have the attitude that you're buying part of a business and not that you're buying something that wiggles around on a charter that has resistance zones or 200-day moving averages or that you buy puts or calls on or anything like that. You're buying part of a business. And if you buy intelligently into a business, you're going to make money. And then you have to buy something that, in my view, which you do if you're buying a business, that you're not going to get a quote on for five years, that they're going to close the stock exchange tomorrow for five years, and that you'll be happy owning it as a business. If you owned Coca-Cola, it didn't really make any difference in 1920. That when it went public, the important thing was what it was doing with customers. And you probably would have been better off if there wasn't any market in it mm. for 30 or 40 years, because then you wouldn't have gotten tempted to sell it. <laughs> and you'd just watch the business, and you'd watch it grow, and, and uh, you'd feel happy. So you, the, the proper attitude toward investing is is much more important than any technical skills. Another question from uh, one of our audience members. With all your success, what keeps you and Charlie going? We have so much fun. Uh, I just talked to him the other day for an hour. and uh, 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 We have fun every time we talk. And we are having, we are doing what we love to do with people we love every day. And, you know, I've been lucky on health. I, 
God knows, uh, you know, how Charlie in 96 and me at 89 with our habits and everything, it's, it's, a, it's a, I don't know what it's a testament to. I think actually it, being happy in what you're doing makes a huge difference. And you don't want to go around having grudges against people. And I mean, all these things, of course, you think negatively, whether it's about the world or about individuals or about your own bad luck or anything of the sort, just forget it, you know, basically. I think, I, I think that helps. How do you clear that stuff out of your mind? I, I don't know whether you're born to some extent that way, but it cert you certainly see that it works, Andy. You know, I mean, you just take the people you know and the ones that are sour on the world, the world gets sour on, you know, basically. And, and mm. so it's, uh, now it's gotta be tough, you know, and, and certainly if you've got some major illness or something of the sort. I mean, that's just, you can have terrible luck in life and, that, that, that's, and it can seem very unfair to you, but, but uh, uh, you're going to have, you're gonna have a better experience in life if, if, if basically you, you, you see the positive sides of things. People will see the positive things in you at that point. And, and if you can find, if you can find some, uh, I'd say look for the job that you would take if you didn't need a job. And if you can find that where you're actually, I don't, I don't think I've had a job. I mean, I've never, I would define work as doing something when you'd rather be doing something else. Hmm. And, and, you know, when I sold shirts at pennies and I was getting 75 cents an hour, I would rather have been doing something else. <laughs> but since I've been certainly 24, I've always, I've never, there wasn't anything else I wanted to do. And I had everything I needed and, Life was wonderful, and and I tell the students that you know you got to live. So you, you may take a job at first for some organization that you don't admire, or work for somebody you don't admire. But but look for somebody you admire. Look, look for somebody where you're looking forward to working with them that day and doing something that you're looking forward to that you'd do if you didn't need the money. And Charlie and I found that a long time ago. And. You're going to turn 90, what, in a few months? About five months, yeah. Five months. Yeah, I'll send you a reminder. I'll send you a present. So, <laughs> well, that's what you're, you're looking really for. Yeah, you, right. you get a second reminder, actually. <laughs> there you go. So looking back over these years, what are you most proud of? Oh, I, well, I, I'm, I'm certainly, but I have to give all the credit to their mother, but I'm certainly proud of how, how my children have worked out. I mean, that's not easy in a sense, having a name that becomes famous or, you know, and thought of as having all kinds of money, although they don't. Uh, uh, but all three of them are now in their 60s. In fact, you're looking at a guy whose youngest child is 61. I mean, that's, <laughs> and, and they've, all, they've all lived very productive lives and they, and they all get along fine with each other. And, they, and uh, I, I've seen a lot of rich families and it doesn't always work out that way. And Another question from the audience. If you were gonna start a business today, what kind of company or what industry would you look to get into? I, I, I do the same thing I've done. I mean, I, I'm- Can everyone I'm, do what you do though? I mean, do you I, think that? I'm cut out for, for managing money. Right. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean, it makes, you know, it's different people have different kinds of minds. I, I, I play bridge with people who can remember the hand they played 30 years ago, you know, and, and watch a basketball game at the same time. But, but, so there's all kinds of different smarts that people have. And, and I've been fortunate enough that I might have been in something that pays off big. And I could be you know, very good at something else that just as much utility to society, but it doesn't, it doesn't fit the market system as well. And then uh, just finally, what um, celebrities that you talked to this year? <laughs> How, you how, oh, hardly. <laughs> how, do that, how do people like Katy Perry or LeBron James get in touch with you? Oh, it, it just, I'm easy to find. I am so okay. easy to find. Yeah, I, and I see all the mail that comes in. Or, and I, I'm not a hard guy to access. All right, so write him a letter. All right, we're going to leave it at that. Warren Buffett, Chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway. Thank, thanks so much for your time. It's been fun. Thanks. I'm Andy Serwer. You've been watching Influencers. We'll see you next time. Warren Buffett needs little introduction. He's the godfather of modern day investing. For nearly 50 years, Buffett has run Berkshire Hathaway, which owns over 60 companies like Geico and Dairy Queen, plus minority stakes in Apple, Coca-Cola, and many others. His $82.5 billion fortune makes him the third richest person in the world, and he's vowed to give nearly all of it away. 
The Oracle of Omaha is here to talk about what shaped his investment strategy and how to master today's market. I'm Andy Serwer. Welcome to a special edition of Influencers from Omaha, Nebraska. It's my pleasure to welcome Berkshire Hathaway CEO, Warren Buffett. Warren, welcome. Thanks for coming. So uh, let's start off and talk about uh, the economy a little bit. And uh, obviously we've been on a good long run here. A very long run. And yet, does that surprise you? And what would be the signs that you would look for to see that things were winding down? Well, I look at a lot of figures just in connection with our, our businesses. I, I, uh, I like to get numbers. <laughs> so so I, I'm getting reports in weekly in some businesses. Uh, uh, that, but that doesn't tell me what the economy is going to do six months from now or three months from now. It, it tells me what's going on now with our businesses. Uh, uh, and it really doesn't make any difference in what I do today in terms of buying stocks or buying businesses, what those numbers tell me. They're interesting, but they're not, they're not guides to me. Uh, if, if we buy a business, we're going to hold it forever. So we're, we're going to have good years, bad years, in between years, maybe a disastrous year some year. <laughs> and and uh, we, we care a lot about the price. We do not care about the next 12 months. But are you surprised at how long this economy has been expanding? I've been surprised by all kinds of things in the last 10 years about the economy. I mean, I, uh, I don't think there was any economist I've ever read that uh, talked about negative interest rates for long periods of time. I mean, if you go back and read Keynes or you read, you read Samuelson, you read any of them, they do not get into a negative rate environment. I think now there's still 11 trillion that's, uh, of government debt around the world that's at a negative rate. So we've never seen it before. And we've never seen, at least the conventional wisdom on a sustained period of long and growing deficits while the economy is getting better, extremely low interest rates, and really very little inflation. So something different is happening, but something different happens all the time. So, uh, uh, and that's one reason economic predictions just don't enter into our decisions. Charlie Munger, my partner, and I, in you know, 54 years now, uh, we've never made a decision based on an economic prediction. We, we make business predictions about what individual businesses will do over time, and we compare that to what we have to pay for them. But, we have never said yes to something because we thought the economy was going to do well in the next year or two years, and we've never said no to anything because we were right in the middle of a panic even if the price was right. All right, so you don't pay much attention to the dismal scientists then, I guess. Well, I pay none in the sense of, as a, as a guideline to doing anything. I, it's entertainment, I mean, you know, it's like going to a variety show or something like that. but. Uh, and I just don't know of any economist that, that actually has bought businesses successfully, uh, successfully or, or, or done well in stocks. Paul Samuelson did, and as you may know he was a big shareholder of Berkshire. But, but uh, it's, you know, they, they make guesses and the, there's so many variables. I mean, in, in the hard sciences, you know, you know that, you know, if an apple falls from a tree, that it isn't going to change over the centuries because of anything or political developments or 400 other variables that go in. But when you get into economics, uh, there's so many variables. And, and the truth is, you've got to expect good times and bad times in business. And if you, if you were to buy an auto dealership and you're, you know, wherever you live locally or a McDonald's franchise or anything like that, you wouldn't try and time the purchase. You'd try and make the right purchase at the right price, and you want to be sure you got a good business. But you wouldn't say, I'm going to buy it because growth this year is going to be 3% instead of 2.8% or something of the sort. Fair enough. You have over $100 billion of cash. Um, Berkshire, Berkshire does. Berkshire. Yeah. Not you. Well, I don't yeah. even see how much yeah. you got. Yeah. Maybe you do. Um, you, Berkshire has over $100 billion in cash, and you say that you always want this company to be a fortress. So how much cash should an ordinary investor have on a percentage basis, do you think? It, it depends on their personal situation. It, 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 if you're working in something where you're, you're living off your, your, your paycheck from, from week to week, 
you want to have a little cash around, and, and you certainly don't want to have a credit card that's maxed out or anything like that. Uh, but if, you know, if, if your house is paid off, if you don't have big living expenses, you got a portfolio of, of decent, diversified businesses, uh, you don't really need any cash. So you can be more cash-free than Berkshire is? Yeah, yeah, I've got responsibility. You know, we've got insurance claims. We could have hurricanes that, you know, would happen. Uh, all kinds of things where we might have to pay out billions of dollars. And I've got over a million people that own shares that are counting on me <laughs> to run the place so we get through periods like that. But if I were retired, I had a, say, a million dollar portfolio of stocks that was paying me 30000 a year in dividends or something of the sort. And my children had grown, the house was paid off and everything. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about having a lot of cash around. Let's talk a little bit about Apple. Everyone always wants to talk about Apple, right? <laughs> it's kind of the it stock, it company. Um, you have a $45 billion stake, more or less. How closely do you follow the company? You know, people are concerned they haven't really introduced any new products. Well, if you have to closely follow a company, you shouldn't own it. Yeah. Really? No, I mean, if you, I mean, if you, if you buy a business, if you buy a farm, you know, you go up and look, you know, every couple of weeks to see how far the corn is up, and uh, you know, you worry too much about whether somebody says this is going to be a year of low prices because exports are being affected or anything like that. You know, you buy a farm and you hold it for. I've got one farm that I bought in the 1980s, and my son runs it, but. I've, I've been there once, you know. I mean, it, 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 it doesn't grow faster if I go and stare at it. You know, I can't cheer for it, you know. More effort, more effort, or something like that. And I know there's going to be some years when prices are going to be good and some when the prices aren't going to be good. I know there's years when yields will be better than others. But I bought the farm. And, and uh, if it, it just doesn't, I don't care about economic predictions on it or anything of the sort. I do care that over. Over the years, it's well tended to in terms of rotating crops, and I hope yields get better, which they generally have. In fact, that farm 100 years ago would have probably produced 30 bushels, maybe 35 bushels of corn per acre, and now in a good year, you know, it'd be 200. I mean, we've really made progress in this country. That's one reason commodity prices, if you go back a couple hundred years, they've moved so little, is because we've just gotten better and better at whether it's cotton or whether it's, it's corn or soybeans or all kinds of things. And you and I have benefited from that. And so Apple is kind of like a farm. Well, it's, it's a, it's a long-term investment. And, and if you own if you owned the, the best auto dealership in town, uh, the best brand, and you had a, somebody good running it, you wouldn't drop by every day and say, you know, how many people have come in today? Or, you know, I think interest rates are going up a little. Maybe it'll slow down our sales or anything. No, you buy it knowing there's 365 days a year, and you're going to own it for 20 years, so that's 7,300 days. And you know, they're going to things are going to be <laughs> different from day to day and year to year. You shouldn't buy it if the day to day stuff is important. Let's switch uh, over to talk about buybacks, which is another hot topic these days. And and you did a fair amount. If you look in the annual report, you can see that between December 13th and, and 24th, um, it looks like you guys bought back about $233 million worth of Berkshire, which was right near that particular stock market bottom. It, how did you know that? Or well, I, what was going through your mind? If I knew it, I'd have bought a lot more than 200 million. No, that, that's not a big purchase for us, actually. And, and uh, now we will buy Berkshire when we have lots of excess cash. All of the needs of the business are taken care of. We spent $14 billion on property, plant, and equipment last year, way more than depreciation. So we take care of the needs of the business. Then we have excess cash. And if we find invest, what we'd love to do is find other businesses to buy. But if our stock, if I think the stock, and my partner Charlie Munger think the stock is selling uh, below intrinsic business value, uh, we will buy in stock. So it obviously was at that point. Well, we, we thought so, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, you know, what's really intriguing is, is when it goes down a lot. I mean, uh, and when, when you're buying dollar bills for, for 60 or 70 cents, which periodically you get a chance to do in stocks, then, yeah, you know, it, assuming you've got the, the cash, you don't want to ever, you know, get so that uh, 
uh, some, some surprise could really take you out in some way. But if we've got excess cash, we'll buy it as fast as we can. But at that point, it would be more like a 2009 rather than just yeah. December of yeah. this past Yeah, year. exactly. It, right. uh, but it's, you know, if you and I own a McDonald's franchise together and it's worth a million dollars and you own 50% of it and you come to me and you say, I'll sell out for 400000 you know, I'll buy you out. If you, say if you want to buy mine, I, I'd be wary of that, but yeah, well, <laughs> for well, just you that be. reason. You should be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but right. if you want $600,000, yeah. I'll just say, yeah, <laughs> come right. back tomorrow. <laughs> um, so just continuing about buybacks, Senator Schumer and, and Sanders um, want the government to weigh in to sort of legislate when companies can do buybacks. Um, and then also there was a report recently about executives doing insider trading, it appears, around the times of buybacks. So are buybacks a kind of a problem? Well, you'll have some people that misbehave and respect them, any activity. I mean, uh, so it really wouldn't have much to do with buybacks. I, I think buybacks, the degree to which they've been part of nefarious activity, uh, and I've observed them for a lot of years, and are very close to zero. But, but that just may be that there aren't enough opportunities. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, that, that article did not, uh, uh, I, I didn't follow the conclusion on it. I mean, you're distributing money to shareholders. Essentially, you can do it by dividends, and presumably American business should distribute money to its owners <laughs> occasionally. And uh, we, do it, we do it through buybacks, or we've done some, and we don't do it through dividends. And, uh, but most companies do it through having a dividend policy. And then if they have money beyond the needs of the business, then I think if their stock is underpriced, then it makes nothing but sense. Should the government tell companies when to do it or at least mandate conditions where they can? Well, they, they do restrict you a little in terms of uh, if you're uh, some general rule of the SEC, if you're having some kind of, uh, this isn't quite the right word, but manipulative activity or anything like that in the stock. But no, I don't think the, I don't think the government should decide your dividend policy. I don't even think they should direct your capital investments. They can make it enticing to make certain kinds of investments. Uh, capital investments, which they do with renewable energy, for example. I mean, the government has interest in fostering certain developments in this country over time, and they do, there used to be a special oil depletion allowance, you know, 50 years ago and so on. Uh, that was more politics than it was governmental policy, but certainly renewables are a prime example of that. But the idea of decide, uh, directing whether you are entitled to return cash to shareholders, and the manner in which you do it I don't think really makes a lot of sense. The 2020 election is going to be upon us before we know it, and um, I know that you had some nice things to say about Mike Bloomberg, but it appears he is not going to be running now. Yeah, it's, it's hard to win with just the billionaire vote. <laughs> <laughs> you have your vote and a few others. Oh, yeah, that's funny. Um, I, but I, I admire him enormously. I wish he had run. I, I want to be very clear on that. President Trump was a business executive, so two questions. Is a business executive the right kind of person to be president? And what characteristics do you look for for a president that you would support? Well, I, I think a business executive can be the right person, but I don't, I don't think that because they're a business executive that, that you give them extra points. Uh, and n number one, I want, a, I want a president that wakes up every morning and, and realizes that the greatest threat to a country which has got all kinds of things going for it are weapons of mass destruction. And that we live in a world where uh, people, organizations, and occasionally countries uh, uh, could have uh, people that would like to wipe out a large percentage of the American people or maybe other countries as well. And that you now have capabilities, which I always thought until recently I might classify it as nuclear, chemical, and biological, but I think you have to add cyber now. I'm, uh, you know, if you, if you have some evil genius someplace that, that for crazy reasons, just like uh, you know, happened with anthrax back, you know, who knows what motivates somebody that starts sending anthrax out in my letters. And if you have somebody that thinks that it'd be great to send a false alarm to the Soviet or to the Russians and to the U.S. that the other side was launching or something of the sort. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, very dangerous world. It's a wonderful world, but it has dangers now that started in August of 1945 and when Einstein said, 
you know, this changes everything in the world except how men think. And, and uh, so I want a president that has that same filter that all of these other things are important, but protecting the country and reducing the chance of successful use of weapons of mass destruction against us is the number one job. And I think, I think most of the presidents, I've talked to a couple of them about it in, over the years, and I, I, I really think that they do realize that they may get lost in the events of every day as they go along. And then beyond that, I want a president that has two objectives with the economy. One is to make sure that this marvelous goose we have keeps laying more golden eggs. And then I want a president that also feels that if GDP is $60,000 per capita in the United States, that nobody should get left behind. We've got a market system that works marvelously in turning out more goods and services, uh, better ones, year after year. Done it all through my life. Would you ever talk to a candidate and say, hey, what do you think about these three things? Well, they'll tell me what I want to hear. <laughs> so I, I want to hear what they tell people who disagree with them on the subject. I, I, I always like to ask a candidate, uh, they usually finesse me some way or another, but I say, what are you for that the majority of your followers are against? You know, I know you really believe in that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And that's really the test, but I'm not sure that except under some kind of sodium pentothal or something. <laughs> You're going to get a great answer to that question. That's great, but that's the question you ask the presidential candidates or presidents that you would speak to. It, if, if I really want to get, and it's, that's why Bernie Sanders was so successful. I mean, 90% of the people who voted for Bernie Sanders had probably not heard of him two years earlier, but they felt they, they, knew, exactly, they, felt they knew exactly what he would do. I mean, they felt he was authentic. And, and if, if you asked him, you know, what he was for that most people might be against, he would tell you, you know. Um, a few questions about Kraft Heinz. Was that a mistake? Well, we'll find out over time, but, but we did pay too much, in my view, for, for, uh, for Kraft. We didn't pay too much for Heinz. Uh, uh, so when we started out, it was originally a non-public partnership between us, and, and uh, but we did pay uh, too much, in my view, uh, for craft, and there's not much you can do about things if you pay too much. Uh, and uh, secondly, there's always been a struggle between the retailer and brands. I mean, if, if I've got a terribly weak brand and I want to get into Walmart, I'm not going to be able to do it. You know, I mean, I have to offer all kinds of crazy concessions, you know, that, uh, and I want to be in Walmart if I, got, I have some sort of consumer packaged goods. The negotiation is way different if you have something essential versus non-essential. Ten years ago, Costco tried to get rid of Coca-Cola. Costco's got terrific loyalty among customers, and you know, and and their own Kirkland brand is a thirty-nine billion dollar brand now, and it moved from category to category, and they only started in nineteen ninety-two. So they they know brands, and they, and, but in the end, they put Coca-Cola back in. Uh, if it had been Royal Crown Cola, <laughs> they wouldn't have had to put it back in. Uh, uh, so there's always that struggle between the brands. I mean, and, 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 and there always will be. But the retailers net, it has been moving in their direction. Uh, particularly, I think, because of the Amazon revolution. Uh, First Walmart, and then... Oh, well, yeah, then, Walmart. Right, and then Walmart, Amazon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, uh, but it's been accentuated, yeah. I think, uh, we have a new retailing environment now. I mean, it, is, it isn't like it goes from night to day, but it, it, it moves somewhat. And, and uh, brands that people have spent billions of dollars developing and sponsoring TV shows or sponsoring radio shows in the old days. I mean, Campbell Soup was always on there with Jack Benny or something, you know, when I was a kid. And, and it was big. Um, uh, and it built brands. And people like, obviously, like the product, too. But people are more willing to change and it's harder, it's, 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 it's a somewhat different world than what, it is night and day. I mean, you are very unlikely to keep changing brands every day. But it really surprised me that, that Gillette lost position. I mean, I, men, don't like, men don't like to experiment much. I, women are better at experimenting, but you know, if, if a kid, if, when you were a kid, the Gillette cavalcade of sports was your pal and 
brought you the Rose Bowl and you know, the World Series and all that sort of thing. You didn't, you just shave with you like the rest of your life. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you still do to a great degree, but it's not exactly the same as it was even five years ago or so when we bought Kraft. You mentioned Amazon as a game changer, and I have to ask you, you haven't bought the stock. You're an admirer of Jeff Bezos. A, a listing of the richest people in America came out. He's number one. I think your friend Bill Gates is number two. You're number three. So you can see what he's done in myriad ways. Yeah. And of course, the question is, how come you haven't bought Amazon? Is there still time to buy? Would you still buy it? Oh, I, I always admired Jeff. I mean, I met him 20 years ago or so. and and and. I thought he was something special, but I didn't realize you could go from books to what, what's happened there. No, I, I mean, he had a vision and executed it in an incredible way, something that it, it would not have, you know. That, but there's a lot of games I miss. I, I would have missed, you know, I would have missed Microsoft even if I gotten to know Bill earlier or something. Those just aren't my games. I don't worry about the things that I miss that are outside my circle of competence of, of evaluating. I, I do, I have missed things who are within my circle, and that's a terrible mistake. Those are my biggest mistakes, you haven't seen them. And, but I don't, it's not a mistake because I miss Netscape or something like that at all. There's, I would say that maybe 5% of the companies or 10% of the companies at most are within an area of my circle of competence. There's something I should be able to understand. All right, well, let me, let me switch gears then and ask you about leverage a little bit. And Corporate debt, people are concerned about. People are concerned about federal debt at $22 trillion. Um, should we reduce, let's just say, the federal debt, and how would we do that? Well, if you're running a deficit getting close to 5%, when things are really good, you know, it, that's a new world. Um, and, uh, for, and, and nobody's, neither the Republicans or Democrats are particularly concerned about it. And we're not having a lot of inflation. That wasn't supposed to happen. You know, but it's happening. That's why I say you don't really, you don't want to get hung up on trying to make economic analysis because you know, nobody's any good at it. Nobody, you don't get rich doing that. <laughs> it, uh, it, it, if you look at, you mentioned that Forbes list, if you get on the list, the number of people have, have done that by economic analysis, I think you're just about zilch on there. Okay, fair enough. Um, Income inequality, wealth inequality, you've talked about the earned income tax credit. Is there more to it than that? Should we adjust tax policy? It seems to be going the other way right now. Well, it is going the other way, but I think, I think, I think the earned income tax credit is the best way to put money in the pockets of people that don't fit well into the market system, but that are perfectly decent citizens and that have made a good bit of the success somebody like I've had with Berkshire or something possible. It wouldn't have happened without the America we have. And if you go back, go back 200 years and we're all working on, 80% of us are working on farms. The person that's the best at that, working on that farm, whatever it may be, uh, uh, is worth maybe twice the ones that's the worst. You know, I mean, that's the difference between super talent and no talent in the farm economy, picking cotton or whatever it may be. Now, if you're the best middleweight fighter in the world, you, know, you may get 20 or $30 million. And, and, and if you are just a good citizen, raise nice kids, help in the neighborhood and everything else, but you don't have market-related skills, you'd be, you'd be good on that farm still and you would be earning something comparable to most of the people around you. But you don't have something now that as it gets more and more specialized, and it's going to continue to get more specialized. You want two things for that person. You want them to have a decent life. I mean, they live in a country with 60,000 of GDP per person. You want, them to, you want them to have a decent life, and they can. I also think you want them to have a feeling of accomplishment. So you want them to have a job, assuming that they're not handicapped in some way. You want them to have a job, but the minimum wage would be one way to say, well, we'll make sure that they have enough money in their pocket, but that's got a lot of effects in disturbing the market system. They just need more cash. They, they don't need a higher wage, they need more cash in their pocket. And, and the government, at a relatively low cost, can provide a decent living for anybody that's living, that's working 40 hours a week and has a couple of children. And, 
we've gone in that direction, and it's sort of bipartisan. I mean, you find both Republicans and Democrats for it. I think it would be better not to have one annual payment, you know, that they get it monthly. And I think there's various things you could do, but you want it. You want them to feel part of the system, and you want to get them, have them get as, as more and more of these golden eggs are laid, you want them to get, 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 get a little more of their share. I mean, if we don't do that and the Democrats win, it's possible we get, you know, big taxes on wealthy people, free college for all, and, and those are yeah, bigger you just, plans. You want, you want more money in the pockets of every, of everybody that's willing to work or is unable to work. And, and we can do it. A rich family would do that. You know, if I had six or seven kids and I had some business I wanted to pass on, you know, you'd pick the most able person to run it because that's the market system to do that but you'd make sure that all seven of the family participated. You'd, you'd give more to the one that, didn't. you might give more to the one that, that, that kept producing the golden eggs, and you would. But uh, you wouldn't just say to the, uh, you know, the one at the lowest end, who might be the best kid of all in, in most respects, you know, he's the one that shares with everybody and does all kinds of things. You, know, and, and you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't say to that, him or her, that, you know, too bad, but that's just the way the market system works, you know. But, uh, uh, go have your, have your spouse get a job and, you know, and look for housing someplace. Right. Um, why don't we do an update about the healthcare initiative, um, which now the company has a name. Yeah. We, Haven. <laughs> Was that your idea? No. No. Sometimes no you, I didn't worry about a name. I, I, we could have gone on as a no-name operation for 10 years as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> no. That, that is, we got a wonderful partnership in the sense that it's got lar it's large and has reasonable market muscle with a m more than a million employees among the three of us. We've got three CEOs that can make things get done in organizations that so are so big that normally they they wouldn't get very bureaucratic. On, you know, I mean, you know, if you tried to do this with many big companies, you'd have you'd have legal weighing in and you know and and, and, and public relations weighing in. We don't have any of that stuff. They may have them in certain areas, but but I don't have to. But Jamie isn't going to worry about the, doing that sort of thing, and, and and neither is Jeff. So so we've got a unity of commitment uh, and an ability to execute on the commitment. The only problem is you know, you've got a three point four trillion dollar industry, which is as much as the federal government raises every year. That that basically is feels pretty good about the system. They as we went around talking to people to find a leader for the group, for example, you know, everybody says, you know, the system, you know, it, it, it turns out very good medicine, but you can't go from 5% of GDP to 18, you know, without, without really um, making you less competitive, among other things in the world. So everybody thought the system needed some adjustment, just not their part of the system. And, and that's very human. I do the same thing, I'm sure, if I was in the same place. So it's, there's an enormous resistance to change, while a similar acknowledgement that change is, will be needed. And of course, if the private sector doesn't supply that over a period of time, you know, people will say then, you know, we give up, we got to turn this over to government, which will probably be even worse. <laughs> How often do you talk to Jamie and Jeff about it? I know Todd Combs, I think, is that, your point. Todd, person. Todd really does all the work at our point. If this works, give Todd one hundred percent of the credit <laughs> from the from the Berkshire standpoint. Does Haven have to buy companies to gain expertise? And what do you? No, it, it, no, I, I don't. What is the plan? I mean, how do you? The, the plan is is to support uh, a very, very, very good thinker on this subject who's who wants is a practicing uh, physician and who commands the respect of the medical community uh, to in effect, figure out some way so that we can deliver even better care uh, and have people feel better about their care, too. I mean, they have to perceive that they're receiving better care over time and, and, and stop the march upward uh, of cost relative to the country's output. We've got this incredible economic machine, but, but we shouldn't we shouldn't be spending 18% when other countries are doing something pretty comparable in terms of doctors per capita, hospital beds per capita, and all that. 
the very top stuff in medicine, I think, is, is very much concentrated in this country, and, and that's great. I want us to be the leader, but I just don't, I think we're paying a price. If we're paying seven extra points of GDP, that's 1.4 trillion a year. You know, at, uh, is the administration focusing, by focusing on drug prices, is that sort of a rabbit hole? Is that missing well, the bigger I picture? I mean, they, they're, they're trying. <laughs> and, 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 and Congress generally, I mean, you talk to the average congressman, uh, they, they, re, they regard it as a problem. Uh, and, and, they may, they, and they see specific instances you know, of drug prices or something like that. But it, 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 it's a big problem to change. I mean, the trouble is it intersects in so many ways. Uh, and, that, it, that, and that's why uh, we've got Gwandi heading it, and we've got three biggest size organizations backing him. We're not trying to do it to make money. I mean, that is, that is not a goal that we end up with some business that, that uh, we make money off of. And will he be talking to health insurers, for instance? Well, he'll be, he'll be talking to everybody. But, but it's, it, it is, uh, uh, his game plan is not something we're going to try and lay out because it, it, it's in his head to some degree. I mean, obviously, we, we selected him uh, by, by hearing and, and reading and so on uh, uh, what he's done. But he'll learn as we go. We, we're con we'll, we will conduct certain experiments, or he will, you know, and, and try out a community where one of us has a lot of employees, maybe. And there's various ways to experiment. Shifting gears, where do you find things like that Abe Lincoln tail and leg quotes? I mean, do you read Bartlett's book of quotations? No, and I don't read it, but uh, probably 50 years ago, I looked at a few Bartlett's quotations, but, but I, read, I read a lot. And if, you just if remember if these things and apply well, them? Well, if you're 88 years old, I mean, you ought to remember something. Oh, well, you don't remember what happened yesterday, but you remember the old stuff. Uh, uh, there, you know, you, you, you've got a lot of interesting quotations in your head, you know. <laughs> yeah, not like you do, I think. That's, that's great, okay. So one company you invested in um, was GE. Yeah. And you did well with that investment. And yeah. yeah, I was too early, actually. If you look back, uh, I was very active in the last half of September and early October, and then I wrote that article in later October. And I knew it was going to get bad. I wrote the article was going to get bad, but I didn't think the stock market would react as much as it did between then and March. Uh, so uh, I, I had more or less used up our pow powder uh, well before the bottom was hit. That's interesting. How have you avoided not getting back into GE more recently? I mean, I'm sure that they've reached out to you. Everyone says, oh, why, why doesn't Warren Buffett invest in GE and save it and take it to the promised land? It's this great American company. Well, actually, uh, you know, I think Larry actually is doing a good job. To Danaher, Larry Culp. To Danaher, yeah, Larry Culp, but to Danaher uh, is a good sale. And I think he's, his priorities are straight, and I think he's a very able guy, and he's on the right track. And I'm a, I'm a fan of GEs in the sense that, that uh, we're a big buyer from them, we're a big seller to them, I've known the managers. You know, I mean, Jack Welch is a very good friend of mine, and we don't agree on politics 100%, but, but we have a lot of fun together, and I love the guy. So I've got a great desire for GE to do well. It hasn't, it just hasn't looked that attractive to me. Right. Um, you talked about the groves of trees yep. in the letters, shareholder. One was the third grove, which was sort of the in-between stakes. The, yeah, the, the equity interests. Yeah, and not, is, it, is it the case that those are sort of not the healthiest grove of trees? No, and why would that be? No, those are the, the pilot flying jays very, you know, they, they're, they're companies that under gap accounting, we have to record under an equity method. We own more than 20%, but we don't control them. And so it's, a, it, it's treated under gap accounting as a special category and, and, and it, it didn't fit well in the other grove, so I had to make it a separate grove by itself. It's, right. not, it's, not, it's not that significant a grove. You say that the, the sum of Berkshire is, has a greater valuation than the parts. That is true. Did you ever try to calculate that? How, how much is that? Well, it depends on circumstances. I mean, there's sometimes when the float from insurance can be very valuable. There's sometimes when the ability uh, to use production tax credits, we'll say, in the utility business, but have them on our, uh, as part of our consolidated return helps. But that varies a lot. It, 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 but it is a plus, it, uh, and uh, uh, we can move capital. Well, take a business like Seize Candy, which we bought 40-odd years ago. It's a wonderful little business. 
it throws up capital. We've tried 50 different ways to expand geographically, do all kinds of things. It doesn't work. And we'll try it again and it won't work. But uh, we can move that capital to buy, help buy BNSF Railroad or do all kinds of other things. So we've got a seamless and, 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 and tax efficient way of moving capital uh, where it's needed. And we've got some companies that really chew up capital and we've got others that kick it off and, and, and uh, we can move it from one, one pot. If you try to do that with your investments, you, you incur some taxes as you go along doing it and uh, it, it's less efficient than what we've got. You talked a lot about um, the tax cuts and the benefits to Berkshire. You didn't really get into the costs of the tax cut, um, which surprised me a little bit. What, what are the, are there costs? I mean, is there just free money? Well, it makes a difference. Uh, the tax cut we get, for example, our utilities, as I mentioned in the report, that goes to the customers. That's just the nature of utility regulation. But, but net, we were a significant beneficiary uh, from the tax cut. I mean, basically, let's just say we had one class of stock. We got two, but stock, you and I own a business uh, together. And we think we own all the stock, but the tr truth is before the tax cut, the government had a 35% uh, share of the stock on income. Now, it didn't have a share of the assets, but it had a share of the income. And if it wanted to change it to 40, it could have changed it, but fortunately it changed it to 21. <laughs> and if we had a private business, if we had a McDonald franchise together or an auto dealership together, you know, the third shareholder, that invisible shareholder, the governor, just handed us back a bunch of the shares of stock. And, and, uh, and, we, and our shareholders benefited and a lot of other shareholders benefited. Right, you talked about uh, Ajit Jain and Greg Abel saying that Berkshire blood flows through their veins. Um, have they made a difference um, since uh, they become vice chairs, and then are they like Warren and Charlie? No, they, they don't. They don't have the interaction. Mm -hmm. They each run a separate business. Inside. Ajit does not think about the other businesses. He thinks about the insurance business, and Greg does not think about the insurance business at all. And uh, and I think about the money and the capital and so on. Uh, but they uh, they're running two very big businesses. I mean, Ajit's business. You know, has uh, you get all told you know, at least a couple of hundred billion of assets. You know, and 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 Greg's business has 150 billion of revenues. I mean, these are they both would fit up there toward the top ten, you know, or so in the country uh, in terms of value. So uh, maybe the top 15, uh, but they're they're very big businesses. But they're not exactly like you two guys. It's not, oh, no, no, no. Right. Charlie and I That's have a partnership thinking yeah. about the whole mm -hmm. place, okay. and we've done it forever, you know, and, uh, and we still do. And Todd and Ted? I didn't see them mentioned. Well, they, 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 they have $13 billion each, including pension funds, that uh, our pension funds, that they, they run. And, and uh, so of the $173 billion we had at year end in equities, uh, they had, well, we had 173 bucks. We had another eight billion in pension funds. So of the 180 or so, they had 26 between them that they're managing. And they got total discretion on that. They don't ask me. At the month end, I look and see what they did. They they don't do much. They don't do a lot of trading or anything. But I I look to see what changes they made. And and uh, Todd, for example, I mean, he he made a couple of small investments in in private placement type operations, and I know what the businesses do, but I can't tell you their names. You know, mm -hmm, just, mm -hmm. that's his baby. Was one of those, uh, you made this investment in Oracle and then you sold it. Was that something they did? And no, I that was not something they did. That was I, something I did. Yeah, and you said you didn't understand it. That's why you sold it. Then why'd you get it in the first place? Yeah, well, that's, that's a good question to which I do not have a good answer. <laughs> I know. I, I see development. I know enough about the cloud to know I don't know enough about the cloud. Right. Okay. Um, so Barclays put out a note, they said they were lowering the estimates for Berkshire, for the EPS. D do you read that stuff? No. Well, I mean, I may read it accidentally, but I don't, I don't seek it out to read, I'll put it that way. But they're, they're, it, it just doesn't make any difference at all. It, uh, I mean, if I spent time reading that, I wouldn't have the time to read 10Ks. <laughs> and uh, we're not going to do anything different. 
I don't know what we're going to earn. As I put in the annual report, and I really think this is unique, I mean, we do not prepare financial statements monthly for Berkshire. And there's just no other company would do it. But there's no sense doing it. I, I, know, I know where the money is. And I, know what, I know how the companies are doing generally. But what difference does it make? Because I'm not going to try and hit any number for the quarter by you know, having a sale on insurance or doing something <laughs> even worse. Uh, so it, it, it and, and Charlie, I mean, he, he, knows, he knows where we stand and, and we know what businesses are doing well, which aren't, and we certainly know where the money is. Mm -hmm. Another one, UBS survey of Berkshire investors says the five most important things to them are succession, investment performance, M&A opportunity, share repurchase, insurance margins. Do you read that or does that no, surprise No, but that, you? I don't disagree with that. I mean, I, I'm glad that somebody understands this. <laughs> Your own investors. Yeah. Um, well, that's important. You know, 54, well, if you go back to when I started my partnership in 1956 that Berkshire came out of, there were seven people sitting there at a table uh, having dinner, uh, relatives primarily, and I, I said, here's the partnership agreement. It's done under Nebraska law. It's four or five pages. You don't need to read it. But I said, here's a little half page, what I call the ground rules. And I want you to read these. And if you feel OK about that, about the interaction, what the expectations are, and all of that sort of thing, then we'll join forces. And if you don't, it's fine. Other people have, you know, but we, don't, we shouldn't be partners. I mean, you know, if I'm going to have a partnership with somebody, I want it to be compatible. It is, you know, it, and when you have a public company, you can't control who comes in. I can't control some guy that comes in and thinks we were going to pay big dividends or split the stock or something like that. So by my actions and my communications and everything, I want to attract the people that from the public market that I want and I want to keep the others away. Costco was built. Sol Price, who started the Price Club and that thing, he sat down and figured out the customer he didn't want. And he set up a system that would keep away the customer he didn't want. Who did he not want? He didn't want somebody buying a quart of milk with somebody behind him with a, with a basket of $200 worth of goods waiting for that. So he put in a membership fee. And by putting in a membership fee, he, he killed all the drop-in business, the business that belonged to the 7-Eleven. We want Berkshire to, to keep out people who have expectations about us that are, are different than ours. I mean, good for them, and I hope they find somebody they fit. But if you're going to run a church, you, you, want, you want your seats to be filled by people that are generally want to listen to your form of religion. And, and you don't want it to change every week and say, gee, I need a new group, and I'll go out and talk to a bunch of investors and get them to come to my church this Sunday. Because there's only so many seats in the church. There's a million six hundred and 45,000 or so A equivalent shares, and those are the seats. And I want them occupied by people that are on the same page I am. The Church of Berkshire. Um, you're, seems like you've got a big weighting in financials, and of course you finally invested in Jamie Dimon's company. Why banks right now? There are businesses I understand, and I like the price at which they're selling relative to their future prospects. I think 10 years from now that they'll be worth more money. And I feel it's a, there's a very high probability I'm right. And I don't think they will turn out to be the best investments at all of you know, the, whole, the whole panoply of things you could do. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that they won't disappoint me. Is climate change changing your insurance businesses? No, it doesn't change the insurance business. Does it change modeling or something in the business? No, it would change our insurance business if we were writing 20-year policies. I mean, if there was something that changed life mortality, adversely to the interests of a life insurance company. You're stuck with a policy for 20 years if you write the life insurance policy and it's, you know, you, you'll keep paying your premiums if it's adverse to me. That's what's happened in long-term care insurance, for example. But when you write a policy for one year at a time, you see what the developments are. And if you know, it, cars, for example, uh, are much safer to drive than they used to be. There used to be 15 deaths per 100 million miles driven. Now there's a little over one. On the other hand, they become much more expensive to fix. I mean, that little little side right side view mirror, you know, which <laughs> used to cost 10 bucks, you know, now a thousand bucks or something like that. So, so you have things that are changing in terms of if you're writing collision experience uh, insurance, you got to allow for the fact that 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 uh, windshield 
the bumper, all kinds of things, or the, uh, the side view mirror and all that are way more expensive. But if you're writing, if you're writing liability, you know that the that people aren't going to die as often. So climate change is like climate. Climate has been changing, but the the truth is that you now can buy uh, really big catastrophe limits cheaper than you could buy them in 2005 or thereabouts, uh, allowing for changes in the dollar and, 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 and concentration of population. So, so, so far, rates have come down. That's the reason we've gotten out of the cat business to a great degree. We were, the, we were a very big writer of cat business 10 or 12 years ago. We aren't out of the cat business because of climate change. We're out because the prices aren't right. Uh, and the world will change. And that's got very serious consequences. But, but it won't change that much from year to year that, you know, we've done very well during a period of some climate change. <laughs> You've talked about technology advancing faster than our ability to understand it. And I'm wondering if social media and Facebook and Google and Russian trolls coming in, and is that maybe an example of that? Or are you still worried about that problem? Well, I think cyber poses real risks to humanity, forgetting about the, the problem of even misinformation. I'm just thinking of, you know, we have railroads running over 22,000 miles of track and some of them are carrying ammonia and some of them are carrying you know, chlorine and things. We have to carry them. We have no choice about that. We're required by law to carry them. And uh, uh, you know, I, would rather, I would rather do that in a non-cyber world than a cyber world. And I would, there are all kinds of things. I, the problem about something like cyber is that it's, it's moving and it's, it's just unpredictable whether you'll get some crazy guy like stuck the anthrax in there, you know, what they can do uh, becomes magnified. I mean, when, when, uh, when you saw what, you know, 19 guys did, you know, non-9-11, I mean, it, the tools in the hands or potentially in the hands of either crazy individuals, uh, crazy groups, or even a few crazy governments, you know, are really something. and and and. And we don't necessarily know what all the tools they have are, and that is moving all the time. I mean, you know, again, Einstein said he said, "I know not with what, 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 what weapons World War III will be felt, uh, fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones." You know, I mean, it's it's a dangerous world. I don't know if you've been following this, uh, Warren, but um, what do you think of Elon Musk's behavior as a CEO? Well, I think it has room for improvement. <laughs> now, he, he, uh, and he would say the same thing. You know, I mean, it, uh, uh, it's just some people have a talent for <laughs> interesting quotes, and, <laughs> and others, others have a little bit more of a blocker up there that says this can get me in a problem. And it, uh, but he's he's a remarkable guy. But uh, I don't see. I just don't see the necessity to communicate. You know, I've never, I, I think I've got seven tweets because a friend of mine signed me up for it and she's called me about a hundred times saying, can I tweet this or that? And I, I've said yes to her seven times, I guess, or something like that. I, I've never actually written one myself. I, I don't even know how to do it. <laughs> Have you talked to Elon ever? Uh, he, he joined the giving pledge, so I, uh, once or twice, but that's a lot of years ago. Uh, you know, seven or eight years ago. I've, I've not, I haven't, he hasn't come to our annual gathering, so I haven't seen him for seven or eight years. So uh, let's talk about this, uh, this trade war that's been going on a little bit with uh, China. And I guess I'd like to ask you, do you think that Donald Trump was right in calling out the Chinese government and basically putting them on notice? I won't have any comment on, 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 on that. It may, uh, in terms of political, uh, uh, activity, I don't put my citizenship in a blind, a blind trust. So when the election comes around, I'll, I'll, I'll do something. On the other hand, uh, people will interpret things I say about any, any president, you know, as to some extent coming from Berkshire, and they and they don't come from Berkshire. You know, I'm just an individual. So I, I, I uh, you know, I think 
I'm glad to talk about China, but I can't, I can't talk to you about that part of it. Fair enough. I mean, do you think there was room for improvement then in terms of the trade relationship between China and the United States? Well, I think that China and the United States absolutely are destined to be the superpowers, you know, of beyond my great grandchildren's uh, lives, and and will always have be competitors, and will be competitors in in business, will be competitors in ideas, all kinds of ways, and there's no other way it would be, and we just have to make sure that that competition doesn't get get us to a point where we don't realize that the best world is one in which both the United States and China prosper. I mean, that, that we do not want to have an island of prosperity in the rest of the world, uh, envious of us in a, in a nuclear age. And, and China doesn't, Russia doesn't. I mean, we all re recognize the dangers of letting competition get out of control and, and, and become, you can, you can be competitors without being enemies. And, and that's, that's what all powerful nations have to realize over time. I mean, it's different than 200 years ago when you could have some dominant uh, country. And then they may have done some things that you didn't like, but it didn't threaten the existence of the world. You really threaten the existence of the world uh, as we know it if important countries do not constantly recognize that they can compete and they can fight over certain things, but they can't regard it as essentially the equivalent of war. Here's a question from Kevin Chen, who is a Berkshire shareholder and an NYU professor. And he says, and this is sort of along the lines of what you were just saying, Warren, but do you think that U.S. and China will be able to resolve their differences or are conflicts unavoidable? Well, I don't think conflicts are unavoidable, but I think, I think it has to be active thinking on the part of every hugely powerful country. And, and Russia is hugely powerful. I mean, 90% of the nuclear arms in the world are between U.S. and Russia. So uh, they, they have to recognize that the best world for them is uh, one where they don't try and grab all the apples, basically. And, and we have to recognize that. And, and, and we can't, in the United States, we, we can't think that either our ideas run the world, you know, or uh, uh, we start getting aggressive about things, and China can't think that, and Russia can't think that, and, and, and that's obvious. You just have to make things, you've got to be sure things don't escalate. And, uh, you know, that World War I, you know, with an archduke, you know. I mean, you get, you get these, you can get chance incidents, and, and you really want to, uh, I asked one of the presidents one time, you know, in terms of what he would do if awakened in the middle of the night with somebody coming to him and saying, absolutely, you know, somebody else has launched, you know, and would you launch on that? And you've got 10 minutes to decide. And I wouldn't want to have that responsibility, but, but you want to make sure you don't get to that point. Right, right. Would you ever make a big acquisition in China? And if not, aren't you missing a huge portion of the world? Yeah, the, the answer is we Britain? would. Yeah, we would. Have you looked? Uh, We've been made aware of things, some things, yeah. Are you concerned, um, on the flip side of the coin, are you concerned that there, the rule of law is different, that uh, the accounting might be opaque? Well, I'd, I'd, wa I'd want to be sure I understood the accounting, obviously. In some businesses, that'd be easier to do than others. But, but I know the laws, the customs, uh, the accounting, the people, better in the United States than any place else. So there's some small hurdle in, in many countries to get over, which I can get over. I mean, but I, but I just don't, it's just not as easy as looking at something where I already know the answer, you know, from previous transactions or something of the sort. So, so it, it, it's easier uh, to make a big acquisition in the United States. I have to do more work uh, if I'm looking beyond the borders, but I love the idea of doing it. Uh, when we made the acquisition in Israel a dozen years ago, you know, I didn't know what the tax rates were there. I didn't, I didn't know what corporate law. You know, I was, I, I suspected that it would all be answered satisfactorily, which it was, but I didn't just automatically know it. 
It seems like you're more open I, about doing a deal in China than in previous conversations. I don't had. think so. No, uh, no I. Uh, no, it, no, I. I it's I, out I'm, there. I'm open. Yeah, right. I, I, we okay. we made, you know, we made two decent sized stock acquisitions there, and they worked out fine. Those are. Well, PetroChina and yeah. BYD. BYD, yes. Yeah, uh, BYD PetroChina. was Charlie's, but right. Charlie's yeah. very well versed on China. Right. right. But, uh, um, the the trade, the U.S. trade deficit has been widening, and uh, of course, a lot of that has to do with our trade with China. Is that something that worries you? Well, I wrote an article about it for Fortune and the, the, the trade situation many years ago, and when when our deficit got to be large in relation to GDP, I don't think it's, I don't think it's essential to have a trade balance, but I, I, I think that if a trade deficit gets large and, and it looks like you have no, way out from it, that that can be, a real problem over time. I mean, you're, you know, you're you're shipping little pieces of paper to the rest of the world. And they're shipping you goods. I mean, people are working, making underwear or shoes someplace, and they get little pieces of paper from us. And it gets very tempting if you've done that enough to make sure that those little pieces of paper aren't worth very much over time <laughs> when they want to cash them for something. So and you don't want to have, we don't have any problem running trade deficits, but but if we ran really large ones and we sort of worked ourselves into a box where they were, we, we didn't really have a solution to get the, the numbers down. It could be a problem, and I wrote about it one time. But uh, it's it's kind of a nice thing, actually. Just I mean, wouldn't you like to have something where you could just send out little pieces of paper and somebody keep supplying you with your food or your you know whatever? I'm you living want. it. You're all right. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yes. we call them credit cards yeah, in the United right. States. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, and last question: uh, China is facing its slowest growth in nearly three decades. The leadership there lowered the targets, I think, to around uh, six point five percent, six percent. Are you concerned about this slowing growth and the impact on global markets? Well, I don't worry about it in terms of global markets. I mean, uh, China's going to grow a lot uh, over time. I mean, they, when you think of what's happened, well, this is 1949 or whatever, you know, but there's been nothing really like it. I mean, you, know, you had 20% of the world's population at that time, perhaps, uh, and it really hadn't remotely achieve their potential. I mean, they had the, the intellectual capacity, they had a, a decent soil, all kinds of things. I mean, and, 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 and what's happened there almost is beyond belief. And, and that game's not over, but we've had incredible developments in the United States. I mean, you know, real GDP per capita is six times what it was the day I was born in the United States, six times. And we thought we were a pretty developed country then and everything. Uh, no, my parents wouldn't have believed it. I mean, they, they would have thought, you know, that uh, this kid has really got it made, you know, <laughs> make more in the United States, and it, it was true. I mean, we had this tailwind, and and China's had a hurricane behind it, you know, in, in the in recent decades. In a good way. Absolutely. Uh, uh, because you were comparing it to the tailwind of the yeah. hurricane no, at their back. At, yeah, at their back, and and and, and they've. They have found a way of life that is dramatically different than existed for the billion. There was a billion then, maybe maybe a billion, two or three, whatever it is now. And and they have changed uh, a country really of size. That's, I don't think there's ever been anything like it. We've done it too, but it took a took, took somewhat longer. I mean, it was, it was a more stretched out. It was a remarkable period, but but uh, you know when you go to I first went there in 1995, uh, and then they regarded it as a miracle, and then I went back 10 years later, and it was a whole different country beyond that. Was... Warren Buffett, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Andy Serwer. You've been watching Influencers. We'll see you next time.